You're listening to Down and Dirty, and I'm Sean Canan. I'm introducing the show today because Creative Loafing just put out its Best of the Bay issue, and I wanted to recognize what they called the best native son, and that is Mario Nunez, one of the hosts of Down and Dirty here. And this is what Creative Loafing had to say about Mario. He said, they said that Mario Nunez is the kind of guy who can tell you where the West Tampa sandwich shop of Carrollwood is, Cafe Caribe, and he can wax nostalgic about nearly every era of Tampa lore without scratching his head. He'll also argue with you about the phrase Tampa Bay and fight like hell to redesign Tampa's municipal flag. The writer of this says, that, sorry, Mario, I like it. He's wrong. The flag's terrible. <laughs> Nunez's greatest strength, however, is how he can make you fall in love with the 813 via his television program, The Tampa Native Show, which airs on Tampa Bay Arts and Education Network. And then Ruffle Feathers on the Down and Dirty Friday morning WMNF Public Affairs program. He co-hosts with former Tampa City Council member John Dingfelder and local politico Jason Marlowe. At 65 years old, Nunez has seemingly lived enough life for three campaigns and the city would be in great hands if there had if he had a protege or three waiting in the wings and tampa native show.com is mario's website so congratulations mario for best of the bay best thank native you. son thank you so much Mario Nunez, we are so <laughs> proud of you. We are so proud of you. You that so well deserved Tampa's native son. I little, think I'm going to write a song. A little embarrassed, but but uh, I'm I'm humbled. And it was you know, thank you. I'd like to I'd like to say as uh, in the immortal words now of Sally Field, they like me. They, <laughs> they like they me. me. You know. <laughs> but but yeah, it was. And and listen, the throw down the party that uh, creative loafing puts on every year the, the last couple of years it's been out there at um at the hard rock it's a pretty fabulous way to kick off the the holiday season you know we're early in the holiday season but but it was quite a jam yeah shout out to our assistant uh part-time producer lynn marvin dingfelder who won no she was a finalist finalist for uh, best filmmaker no and and we had and wmnf is also well represented there because uh, the great bob seymour was walking around he oh, was nice. nominated he was there and he shout out to kim overman he said that our guest today Day. He said that he loves Kim and their old buddies at the at the porch there in Seminole Heights. Also, DT and Dwayne Terry from from our studios was there. Uh, DJ Spaceship was there. So, and I saw at the very end of the evening, I saw Ben Montgomery walking around. So we were WMNF was pretty well yeah. represented. Jason's going up next uh, next year for best sidekick. Let's yeah. go! I love it. Let's go! I love we, it. We need to get this done. But thank you everybody for for the um, for the well wishes and and for the and, you know Facebook being what it is. Uh, you can't get to everybody. And thank everybody because there's so many people that, that will come in and, and offer either birthday wishes or congratulations. But I, I'm grateful, and I hear you, and I love you guys, and I thank you so much for your very, love and support. Very proud. Very proud. All sure. right. So we, let's get our show going today. We, are we going to do a little bit at the, at the beginning? Let's, let's, let's do yeah, one, thing. Let's one thing. One thing. One thing. We're either mad so or it could happy. Be down, it could be down or, or dirty, dirty. And, uh, or it could be maybe light and breezy. Or it could be and. All right, let's go. Well, hit them with the, hit them with our phone numbers first, so they can line up. Uh, That's right. We want to get we want to get the callers in, in the queue. queue. <clears throat> so call in if you're calling and you want to talk to us today. The number is eight one three two three nine nine six six three. Email dj at wmnf dot org and text us because that's what the young kids are doing today. Eight one three four three three zero eight eight five. And I can assure you, I'm sitting right by the computer right by the monitor, and I get your calls, and I get your emails, and I'll be sure to give you proper airtime if you have a question or a comment today. We're going to start with the young fellow today, the whippersnapper, or you want to go first, John? Uh, I think we have to start with Diane Feinstein, uh, Senator from California. Uh, we're very sad about her passing. What an illustrious life she had. Truly. Uh, she broke uh, more glass ceilings than most people will ever see in their lives. Uh, she started out in San Francisco as the uh, uh, what they call their city council supervisors, board of supervisors. And um, she was there when Harvey Milk and the mayor... 1977? Uh, yeah, got shot down like almost right in front of her. And very tragic. 
but she stepped up and she was the one who announced to the city what happened, basically took command and stepped in uh, to become the, the, the mayor of uh, San Francisco. And her career went on from there. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, this just happened before we went on the air, you know, within the last couple of hours. So we felt compelled. John, I think it was uh, worthy commentary. And what I was reading about was about her. She had many, many um, firsts in the U.S. Senate, but uh, she was a big proponent of gun control and also to control the, uh, the torture uh, that had gone on, um, you know, in the military or as related to the military in, in the Mideast and that sort of thing. The waterboarding. Yeah, all that. So she, uh, she said, we got to get hold of this and had a lot of Senate hearings and passed some laws in that regard. But I'm sure she did thousands of other things that, uh, that we could, don't have time for. So, so quickly, <clears throat> tell everybody now what we can expect as far as the, the, process, the, well, the process, just, you know, the yeah, process. Yeah, and, and I don't know who the front runners are. I don't know what the governor has in mind, but uh, Jason, what do you hear? You hearing? had Barbara Lee, uh, what the Adam Schiff, and Katie Porter all in that race as it currently stood. Okay. So, who knows? So the question is, all three wonderful candidates. Will yeah, the governor honestly. of California actually appoint somebody who's running and really wants to stay there or will, they, will he just appoint a placeholder because right. it's only for a year, I think. So anyway, it'll be interesting to well, see how that plays and, out. And quite a position now that uh, the governor finds himself in because he could literally put his thumb on the scale there and, and kind could. of tip the balance. So we just need to watch that. What do you got, young fellow? All right, so I'll, I'll just briefly talk on, on a, something that a Councilman Vieira made a motion on before council yesterday to talk about the city council. I mean, listen, as someone who wrote two op-eds in Creative Loafing about the importance of increasing our municipal turnout, I I would be hypocritical of me to not suggest that we study any possible angle that could get more turnout. I mean, the the thirteen percent isn't going to suffice. It's wild to me that we're having like. What's he proposing? So he had proposed moving uh, city council elections to be in line with gubernatorial presidential elections. I'll say over a lot of thought, I'm not really sure if that's the move. But like personally, I do think in having some conversations with some folks who have studied this, I'd propose we move it to be in line with the same cycle in the sense that it's during an off year. But instead of March and May, we move our municipal elections to August for the primary and November for the general. The same as we have everywhere else, just on an off year. And I think people are more psychologically prepared to vote November and August. That's what we've conditioned folks to do over years. And I think that's part of the reason why it's like it's impossible to get folks chinned up for an election in March because, one, you'll have just come off an election in November. Then you have the holidays. And it's become basically a sprint for here at Tampa City Council. People file in January to run an election in Eight March. Weeks. And it doesn't serve the public. It doesn't serve the voters. It doesn't serve the city. And so I, I think Lewis is on to something, but I think you got to tweak it. Well, this issue... <laughs> you stick around long enough, you see these issues can come back. This issues comes up about every five or ten years, and um, you know the downside is if you're you know right now, if the city council election is the only thing that's going on, and so the people who yeah. care about politics focus on it, it could get lost in a gubernatorial. I agree. I year think it would get or, lost or a presidential year. Uh, your idea is an interesting one. Yeah, too. I think I think you would. I think it would get lost. And I'll say just to to wrap it up, I'll say it would really inhibit your candidates because now you know the folks who raised seventy thousand dollars and are barely able to communicate in the sea of noise that's already existing. Now imagine you're running for city council and you're on the third page of the ballot. Well, plus just fundraising. Yeah, because precisely. if you're competing, will be tapped out. Yeah, you know, with those other big races. It's a lot harder to yeah. fundraise. So that's too. why I think you, you maybe move it to August and November in the same year. Just it might be a compromise. It, precisely. And I think it would engender more turnout. You make the election longer. There's more opportunity for vetting of candidates. If you're a candidate with no money, you can knock more doors. You're a candidate with money, you can make more phone well, calls. As somebody who's run for several of these seats at different times of year, it's it's really nice to run in January. Yeah, I'll and say. Walk, yeah, yeah, knock yeah. doors in January, in January. As, as compared to July. I will, con- I will confirm <laughs> that that is correct. <laughs> you just heard from our guest. So I'll end it with a little, I'm going to sprinkle a little sugar on this, and I'm just going to say. A little sugar. Yep, yeah, a little sugar. I'm just going to say thank you again to Creative Loafing <clears throat> for the work they do, right, for that publication that comes out that we need, because that's kind of the man on the street voice, right? And it's it's beyond that as well. But um, they, they're an integral part of our uh, community. Uh, and thank you for uh, Ray Roa, uh, again, for the recognition bestowed upon me. We wish uh, Creative Loafing nothing but years and years and years of success. The yeah. papers the papers come out, and they're in the mail, but they're in the boxes on the street corner. So find them, because all you have to do is pull open the door, 
reach in and grab a paper. Or, I mean, or pull it up online. And by the way, I think Sally Nunez deserved uh, honorable, yeah, well, she, men, honorable yeah. mention. She has tolerated Let you me for so tell long you. with you for so many years. Let me tell you. I'd, I'd be in arrears a long time ago if I, if I had to compensate her for the work that she's done raising our children and, and just being the, the anchor that kept everything together. So love you, baby. Thank you for that. There we go. So, hey, introduce our guest today. All right, John. Jason. Jason, the honor's yours. Uh, oh, man. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. She's All a right. good so, friend. I around mean, the horn. She's literally, I, I'm going to be honest, she's one of the best people that I know. She's uh, been a mentor to me and a friend in times where I really needed one. And she was a hell of a county commissioner who fought. I mean, ferociously on housing, on a number of other issues, and we are bereft without her presence there. But uh, real quick, in her honor, we're going to just segue to uh, this is in honor of uh, City Councilman Phil Collins. Uh, nice, very, very nice. Gotta love, gotta love some Tampa City yeah. Councilman Phil. Collins. So, is there a theme there? I mean, I, oh yeah, we're talking, we're talking about housing, and I mean, who better to talk about housing than the one and only Commissioner Overman? Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, Jason, and I have um, not forgotten the wonderful opportunity I had to serve as a county commissioner and work on housing and human trafficking and transportation and actually good financial stewardship. Uh, looking for an investments in our infrastructure that actually makes sense, and housing is one of those. Well, you brought a, a tremendous uh, background to County Commission on all those issues. Yeah. I mean, I recall when we first met, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years ago or whatever, uh, we didn't really know each other. But, uh, you know, I was very impressed with where you had come from. Give us a little bit of that. Well, the, the good news is I had an opportunity to really serve the community as a community advocate, but also... To serve on boards, and I will recommend to anyone that has a passion for city, county, uh, community issues, uh, all of the municipalities, whether it's county or city, have community activist boards, uh, and they're not really called that. They're called community advocate boards, but uh, citizen advocate boards, and I served on the city of Tampa's budget and finance board for many, many years, uh, that committee actually looked at the city budget and made recommendations to the city council and to the mayor on things that needed to, to be addressed and prioritized. So I got real familiar with municipal finance, and that was very, very educational. It gives you the grounding so that when you do decide to step forward, you actually know what you're doing, which apparently isn't something that's required and probably ought to be. And you're not drinking from that proverbial fire hose because it, it can be uh, overwhelming. Oh, it's that first year, you literally are drinking from a fire hose because even though I had spent many, many decades on the MPO, on the city of Tampa's b budgets, committees, and many opportunities to learn about government, that first year, you suddenly discover that you are way more responsible for so many decisions. So it was a great opportunity, and I truly enjoyed it. That's where we first, uh, first met, Kim, yeah. if you remember. Yeah. The, standing in the line waiting to speak at 12 midnight, whenever it was, we were. it was the MPO. It was, oh, the, it was stop the MPO. T stop the, TBS. Yeah, the, the, the TIF hearing. And <clears throat> yeah, I'll tell you, boy. there's where you really recognize how important it is to hear from your constituents. Constituents have a, a voice mm -hmm. if they take it. And actually, what's really been helpful at the county level is that you can sign up to speak virtually if you can't get downtown. Yep. You know, being downtown at 9 a.m. or being downtown can at be 6 p.m. is very hard, yep. if, especially yep. if you work full time and you need to be able to sit on that line uh, and call in and be able to get your point across. Yeah, one of the positive of things of, of COVID uh, was the virtuality of, of life. Of participation. And yeah. it really does right. truly matter. Yep. Yeah. So tell us uh, affordable housing. It, it was clearly one of your passions when you were on County Commission, and now it sounds like it's 99% uh, of your life, except it, for your family. It is. It is. I have been asked, because of my passion for uh, affordable housing, to create a housing council or to bring all the stakeholders, because it's very siloed. 
you know, we've got the county, we've got the city, we've got the developers, we've got the bankers, we've got the foundations, we've got the agencies that help rehome people that become homeless. And what's this organization called? Uh, the Housing Leadership Council of Tampa Bay. It's a nonprofit, and it's in its infancy. We we filed this year. Uh, we'll have our first leadership team meeting at the Children's Board on the 23rd of October. Uh, that's going to be an all-day beat meeting, although you'll have a break for lunch in case you have a luncheon appointment. We don't want to keep people from actually networking and doing their great jobs as they do during lunch times. But we also know that there are a number of organizations over the last four years that have put together a really great strategy to address the inequities and the dysfunction that occurs in the housing industry. Um, and how important it is to advocate for funding, not only at the state level, but also at the local level. But when you say, you know, the housing industry, I mean, we look around and there's housing going up everywhere. Cranes so what, everywhere. So what's the problem? Well, the challenge is uh, Tampa's the, the best place in the world to live. You know, everybody and their brother. And Who's we saying stop, that? Can we stop telling people this? Like, <laughs> well, don't move here. Don't Georgia, move here. there are other places. I like, think the secret's out. So you're not going to win that battle. Genie's uh, out of the bottle? It's out of the bottle. And unfortunately, uh, because l- long-term uh, property values here had not escalated at the same rate as a lot of communities, it is now very inexpensive for people to move here and buy a home for cash. Uh, and investors know that, so they're building to uh, that, uh, and it, that has actually created a greater amount of demand than for the workforce that lives here. Uh, the workforce that lives here is average income can't afford not only to buy a home, but anymore to rent a home. And so we are well short, probably 54000 actual housing units shy. That's a significant number. It's a big number. Is that Bay Area or City of Tampa? That's actually the the Tampa Bay Area um, of the units necessary to provide housing for the people who live here. And those are are our our single-family moms. Four out of five single-family moms are spending more than 30% of their income on housing. That means our kids have nowhere to live. And if we want our kids to learn, they need stable housing in order to be able to thrive. So this is where, a, where do they get pushed when they're, you know, when they can't rent on their own? Um, you well, know, what, what happens to those families? Uh, well, honestly, they're living in their cars. Mm-hmm. There are, if you actually the couch school, surfing school sometimes, system, right? couch surfing. Um, I have a family member that's been surfing since last August, and um, they were with me for a period of time. But uh, I live in a house with it's kind of dangerous for a two and a half year old. But that's not also, you know, it's not dangerous to put a child and their family in a motel because that's the only resource that's available for the housing rehoming folks that are trying to find a place to keep people safe, whether that be, you know, Suncoast United Way or Tampa Housing um, Homeless Initiative or whether it's the counties or the city's services that provide places for people. Do we have a number, and can we put a number on the the amount of homeless people that in, in the Tampa Bay area or specifically in even in downtown Tampa, you know, sometimes we see a lot of folks it's, that gather there around the park. It's and- staggering. When we do the homeless count, um, I'm, I'm going to probably get the number wrong, but I think it's close to about 3,800 people. Mm. And that's all of all of Hillsborough. Sure, but but it's it's staggering, and you don't realize it because they they're in you know they're in their cars. they if they have one, uh, if they don't have one, they're on the street. And the dysfunction that occurs in a community when a family loses their home is so detrimental to the community as a whole, because not only do you lose your shelter. But you lose everything you've bought over the last, you know, 10 years or so. You know, you lose your silverware. You lose every, your clothing. You lose your furniture. And to get rehomed costs And then re so all of that again. Right. So not investing in median income cost housing is a fool's errand because it actually harms our economy at a level that really hurts the community at the most. So why is it the private sector is not stepping up? I mean, there's... Usually, if there's a need, the private sector will satisfy that need. Why isn't that happening? It's starting to happen. Mm -hmm. We are starting to see more and more builders and developers that are actually looking into opportunities to take advantage of the tax credits, as well as the funding that's available, uh, with the county making a decision to actually sweep 80% of the Hope Trust for affordable housing. You know, that's also the, the return on investment when a developer actually builds housing for our median income 
You know, I rarely say anything nice about Tallahassee, but uh, but in this case, uh, you know, it appears that this past spring, Tallahassee did some positive things uh, for, you mentioned tax credits. What else? Well, and that's, that's where our local politicians don't understand what the Live Local Act was. It does provide a significant amount of funding to supplement the monies that have been swept from the Sadowski Housing Trust for decades. And uh, that, but that money has ties to it. It has all kinds of ties to it. So it's not just free money to build housing. It's going to take some time for the builders and developers and the planners and the zoning folks all to get their arms around how that money can be spent. And that also applies to the city council's commitment. They made a commitment for the CRA dollars. It can only be used in those areas uh, towards housing. But again, you have to recognize that siloing causes dysfunction. So the Housing Council, the Housing Leadership Council's job is to bring all the parties together to have them speak about the best ways they can build those relationships and build more housing. So out of curiosity, you mentioned last Thursday, and I've been looking forward to talking about last Thursday, primarily since last Thursday. Who would have thought? <laughs> and one of the what things... What was last Thursday? So last Thursday yeah, was the go. budget meeting, uh, for those who aren't aware, in which, I mean, maybe 50 people from county commission. Hope... Yeah, to the county commission. And these are 50 folks. These are interfaith leaders. These are, you know, imams. These are pastors Hillsboro of every single denomination. Organization for Progress, progress and Equality. equality yes. And I'm like, I mean, you know, these are folks from every single denomination nomination of every single faith, ordinary people, people of privilege who are speaking on behalf of other people who don't have the that kind of luxury, you know, genuinely decent people who, like you said, are taking time out of their Thursday evening when they could be sitting, eating home, you know, eating dinner at home with their families to speak on behalf of those who are most in need. And for Donna Cameron Cepeda, a woman who was living in affordable housing till last year, to vote against it. I'm going, to re- I'm going to read your quote back to you because it deserves to be reread. This is uh, Kimberly's quote in the Tampa Bay Times about uh, Donna Cameron Cepeda. <clears throat> County Commissioner. The hypocrisy is astounding. She spent years benefiting from housing support, housing investment, affordable housing subsidies, yet she chose not to support further investments. It boggles my mind. So let's talk about your boggled mind and let's talk about how brutal <laughs> that Thursday was. Because genuinely, it was so many genu- decent people of every single stripe and shape all begging for the county to make a singular commitment Passion to looking pleading. out Passion for people. Yeah. They, and what did they do, Kimberly? Well, they, they basically swept it by 80%. Yeah. And, you know, that, that Hope Trust was put into place in my first year in office, and I was very proud of the fact that Hope had come to us, had been working on it for like 12 years, to get a commitment by the county to do that. And to not fund that trust that was already established. It was a promise to pay. It wasn't in law. It was an ordinance that was passed to create the trust, but it wasn't in law that it was required to be funded. It was to be considered. And I do recognize that the chair had been trying to get money for sidewalk for like 10 years in his community, but it could have come from other places. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I was actually, I like Ken Hagen. I've known Ken Hagen for 25 years, I think. I was disappointed in Ken Hagen on that vote, on that motion. I was too. Well, so because because is- he was the swing vote. And it didn't have to go that way. Um, like you say, Kimberly, they probably could have. Uh, I, how big is that budget? $9, well, it billion, was $9 dollars. billion dollars. And there was a reserve that was flexible enough that not to reduce the, you know, the, the reserve, but there was enough monies going into the reserve that's required by the county. But there was enough of a margin of, a, of accomplishment for it that would not have hurt our tax rating to be able to actually fund the th- other things that the commissioners were asking for that were not in the budget. Yeah, they were just looking for a whipping boy, I think. I mean, well, the pain the is the point. Discrimination against affordable housing is pain real. Pain is the point. Good. Pain is the point. Yeah. I mean, genuinely, like, and I'll say, like, in, in mild defense of Ken, he was offering us a mercy because the other three county commissioners wanted to take every dime. So the fact that they still got two million is literally only because of Ken's limited mercy on that. Like, not to you know defend him, but that is the truth. I mean, like, I'll just I'll end with on this note. The saddest part about all this is. $8 million does nothing for sidewalks. It's a million dollars a mile of sidewalk, as we've talked about on this show now multiple times. So you're going to tell me eight miles of sidewalk is more important than $8 million in housing? It's always about priorities. 
Obviously. Mario, let's get some calls. <clears throat> no, that's what we want to do because now we're getting down and we're getting dirty. And we want to hear from you if you've got a question or a comment. And who doesn't want to uh, comment on, on our housing situation here in the Bay Area? Call us at 813-239-9663. Irene is standing by to take that call. You can email us if you don't want to call. DJ at WMNF.org. Text us if you're too busy to do either. 813 Eight, five. Homelessness yeah. is a super big problem around the country, but because we have so many more people moving here now, it's it's becoming, you know, this NIMBY thing. It's 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 in our backyard already. And, and li- listen, and while while we care for that person on the corner with their hand out, you know, that sort of thing, we're what what we're what we're talking about a lot is the the family in the in the car mm-hmm. sleeping in the Walmart parking lot that sort of thing with a couple of kids i mean we care about all of them but our hearts really have to go out to that family and those children. I would say, too, the missing middle, man. Don't forget, so many middle class folks have been put out of you know a, what would have been decent housing because of rising costs. And the long-term impact of having a child not have stability when they're two and three and four and five and six years old, you know, they do not ever recover from that. So by not funding housing, we're creating that pipeline to prisons because Traumatized there's no children. alternative for moving forward. So as you and I have seen serving... Uh, on zoning boards like city council or county commission, there's a lot of NIMBY out there, Mm -hmm. not in my backyard. Backyard. Mm -hmm. So on on the one hand, people say, oh yeah, affordable housing, that's a good thing, that sort of thing, until a developer proposes it in your neighborhood. Then what, Kim? Well, interestingly enough, the housing that's being built now for people that actually need some assistance is always in mixed income housing right now. And it oftentimes with a good developer. So what does that mean, mixed income? Well, it means you'll have people that are paying market rate and you'll have people that are getting subsidies, subsidies. in order to pay the rent that's being charged in, to support in the, the same complex in, in the, the same, same building. So the discrim the real economic discrimination factor that causes that NIMBY effect is is mitigated by a change in strategy that many of our um, affordable housing builders have addressed. Yeah, over there on Main Street, I uh, can't remember the name of that that. Uh, Big project over there, but they tore down the old ugly projects. Yes. And they rebuilt that. uh, Uh, Encore? uh, uh, No, you're talking about West West River. Encore is a good example. Rome Yard. Rome Rome River. Those are all exactly what you described. Mm -hmm. Those buildings, as you drive down, they're lovely buildings, and they're filled with folks. Some of them paying market rate. Some of them are, are being subsidized, and nobody right. knows the difference. And and w- there's a misconception. We see building all the, you know, there's skyscrapers everywhere, and they're building, you know, they're building housing, but they're building luxury housing mm-hmm. because our new residents can afford them. But the challenge is there's no migration from uh, your starter home up the ladder or the person who bought a starter home that's now a grandmother that can't afford to go anywhere else. So they're not downsizing from that four-bedroom house to a one-bedroom condo because they can't afford to make that change. So some of the blue states, uh, Maryland comes to mind outside of D.C., they are allowed to, the local governments are allowed to mandate some level of affordable housing in each one of those new buildings. Um, there's a term for it. I can't remember what the, the term. You probably know it. But, but uh, you know, we, where the local government can say, yeah, you, we'll give you zoning approval for that new building, but you got to do 20% affordable housing or workforce housing. Um, in contrast, the state of Florida has definitively said by statute and law that no, 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 local governments, you cannot mandate that. What's that term called? I can't remember. Well, it, there is a, typically it's exclusionary housing. That's it. That's um, it. Yeah. Or inclusionary housing. And that strategy is actually to make sure that there is some affordable housing allocation to a community. We don't have the political courage to do that kind of work. Well, and they specifically in Tallahassee told us we can't. Exactly. Yeah. Even if we wanted to locally. We've got a caller waiting to talk to <clears throat> us. And I, I also want to mention, before we go to the caller, uh, the homelessness situation, uh, it, as you mentioned earlier, Kim, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help the constituency at, at large. It doesn't do anything to upgrade how we feel about ourselves. And, and the damage is long-term, and it seems, to, it, it seems to be coming more and more pervasive. And even but, if you didn't really care as a human being about those folks... 
Those are the folks who are serving you meals at restaurants, who are washing your dishes, who are mowing your yard. Teaching your kids. Teaching, Teaching your, your kids. kids or, and, their, and their kids are going to school with your kids as well. Yeah. Let's see what um, this lady has called us before. I know she has, and we're going to bring her online now. Layla and Brandon. Did I pronounce it right, Layla? Because I think I did. It's actually, it's actually Leela. I know. I messed it up again. Yeah. <laughs> I did that the last time. Yeah. Leela, so the next time, make yeah. sure that you, when you give your name. Give the tell pronunciation. Them, yeah, yeah. Get, tell, them, tell them it's. L E E L A. Or Mario's but, but just I bad should, at names. But I it should know be because it says Brandon. And you, yeah, you've called us before. Yeah, I have. But my comment is I was at the Children's Board uh, last week after the Hillsborough County uh, meeting. And I was just, what my, my thought was after feeding the homeless for the last 15 years and being the small person that works in the trenches, gets no donations, no grants from the county, and to see the the Hillsborough Homeless Initiative received $4.6 million to house the teenagers and those in need that I know that money will not go to. I know the history. $9 million budget, and now the, the Tampa is involved in this, and our, you know it's not working. And the sad part is a $5 million complex to house the homeless instead of taking them to jail when we're spending $59 million of taxpayers' dollars on incarcerating the homeless and the mentally ill in Hillsborough County. And we're having two people die on the streets because our infrastructure is so messed up with no roads. And then we're allowed to um, think that we're making a difference. You know, no, it doesn't make a difference. And I just wanted to say that I, I saw more Louis Vuitton purses at that meeting at the Children's Board of recipients of the monies from HUD than I've seen in my life. You know, that, uh, you know, these people are working and they're making tons of money to supposedly help with the help homeless epidemic in Hillsborough County. But in reality, that's not happening. In reality, there's a group, small groups. There was a lady from the school board that I thought immediately the homeless initiative would have said, we want you to work with us to make sure those teenagers get into housing. But instead, they're going to call the shots and nothing will go to those kids. Well, Lila, we appreciate all you do personally out in the community. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Leila, for your call. Thank you so very, much. It was a very good meeting, and the the young people that were at that meeting that have benefited from that program were truly appreciative of it. Thanks for the call. So, um, what are, another thing that you were passionate about as related to these issues, uh, Kimberly uh, Commissioner, um, was the uh, rent control, and I actually remember. Uh, when I was on city council and you were on county commission and, and we traded emails because you're allowed to. Uh, that's not a sunshine violation when you're on different boards. But we talked about uh, how to get rent control into place. So what did Tallahassee do with that? And what was rent control about? Uh, well, it was a combination of several things. We passed a tenant bill of rights in order to make sure that people who had subsidy income or monies coming in from a housing support or to not be discriminated against. And so that those that income would qualify for their ability to apply for a lease to rent a place. Uh, so we have got that in place locally and several other municipalities did too. Well, Tallahassee said, uh, there's too many different rules. So we're just going to kill that whole thing. So it pretty much decimated the ability for a tenant to defend themselves uh, against discrimination when it comes to where their income comes from. And that could be someone who has veterans assistance. That could be a senior with elder assistance. That can be, you know, of a young family with housing assistance. Uh, and, and that makes it much more harder for someone who's trying to find a place to live. Of course, insurance doesn't help with insurance prices getting to a point where landlords are going, well, I got to pay the insurance on it and those rates are going up so high, so I got to raise the rent. But there was also a hesitancy um, of landlords to actually rent to people with subsidies. Again, economic discrimination is real. So those, those Tallahassee made a decision not to allow for not only uh, tenant bill of right provisions, but then also permanently struck the ability to have any municipality decide that a uh, housing crisis existed to implement a, a rent control st uh, strategy. Yeah. And so that's been wiped out by Tallahassee. Yeah, the, 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 the good bill that Tallahassee passed last spring was sprinkled with some of this... Uh, yeah, that was embedded in it in a little tiny sentence somewhere. And yeah. unfortunately, the, the consequences are grave. 
to yeah. to uh, pick up on on what our young board op uh, across here and he's he's he's, he's, he's looking taking at, a slight bow. Yeah, there he is. Um, I, it said earlier. I think it's bears repeating. It feels like pain is the point yeah. in all of this. Cruelty and how, is, the, is and, the point. And how can and how can these people be so? Heartless, I think, is the other thing that comes to mind. We want to get another Our caller. Our board is lighting yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, Kimberly, yeah. So you is, are very popular. Well, this is this is going to the dentist. This is that root canal that you've been avoiding because now we've got to talk about this homeless epidemic, as Leela said from Brandon just a little bit ago. So let's talk now to, and I'm going to butcher this name. No, I'm not. This is Anza or Anza from Tampa. Did I did I pronounce that correct? It's Enza Aiello, yes. Hi. You know, I'm going to get two it. on names. You know, and, and I've got a Latino name. I should, ethnic as it is, I should be able to we do know, this. We know Enza. Hi, okay, Enza. Enza. You're on the air. Italian. Um, yes, I wanted to bring up the Emergency Solutions Grant, grant that provides um, funding for emergency services to individuals and families who are homeless or mm -hmm. facing homelessness. It's funded by the CARES Act. Mm -hmm. especially, you know, for financial setbacks or resulting from COVID-19. I'm just wondering if the, uh, the speaker ha knows more about that and if it's still available to people to apply for. And Enza, I want to give you a shout out um, because you and I met 20 years ago. And uh, you were one of the few realtors that I know who was concerned about affordable housing and, and trying to get involved in it. So I'm going to give you a shout There out. are still good people out there, J.D. There you go. There are still good people. There are. There are. And Anza, thank you very much for the work that you do. Uh, good point. Um, in my last year, we had basically three budgets to balance. We had the, AR, the ARPA, uh, that was actually the bill to restore our, our uh, communities. We had CARES, and we had our regular budget, the county budget. Uh, the county does, no, does not any longer have CARES dollars remaining or our ARPA dollars. I was able to get some of our ARPA dollars invested in housing while I was there. However, those budgets and those monies are gone. So it is now... They were well spent. They were well spent. Right. And they were spent efficiently and actually faster than any other county in the state, as but best depleted. I can tell. But, but we planned it out very well. We've invested it wisely. And we used it to be able to support the community as it needed. The challenge we have, however, is now we're back to regular budget, which is still $9 billion. How many units, uh, Kimberly, approximately did you... Were you able to accomplish using the CARES money and the ARPA money? The ARPA money we got, I believe it was about 175 units. I was able to, to restore a, we bought a hotel, I mean, a, an apartment complex to rehab. So I fought hard to get that funded. Uh, we bought several other properties that were able to rehab those properties for affordable housing that otherwise would, would have gone into Dakai or gone into market rate. So that we used where it was the lowest cost way of actually increasing the number of units for affordable housing quickly because any new project that comes that our developer brings to the table takes three to four years to actually produce a unit. So this way, it was a way we were able to actually do those in less than a year and be able to move that, those families into secure housing quickly. Thank you for your call, Enzo. We certainly appreciate it. I have a question that just came to mind. So sometimes, you know, we have these hotels that sit idle. And you mentioned it earlier. I mean, can these be repurposed? Can, can you know, what, what are some of the viable solutions? The, the little motels. The, the motels, yeah. right, right. Florida the, you know, the Avenue, two, Nebraska. Hills. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Bush Boulevard. My neighborhood. So, so, you know, what can we do? Because we, we are very good at, at illuminating uh, problems here, but we are also very good at, at offering s solutions. And I know this is not a quick fix. You know, Kim, you, you know this. This is a tough slog. And you have to have the will to do it. Tallahassee can weigh in on this. And, and again, the other thing that be, besides pain... Eminent domain. Besides pain being the point, I think that we should... It be a good time to mention elections have consequences. Mm -hmm. What can we do to... Uh, to in the near term. And it, motels are a, a little challenging. They offer an opportunity because it's a space that people can sleep in. But people do more than sleep. You know, they need to be able to prepare meals. They need to be able to have enough room for two or three children sometimes, especially since that's the highest level, the highest percentage. 59% of those folks that were home insecure Their families. Are, are, are single parents with families. Mm. So they're kids. 
And that's just not okay. But it's also not okay to stick a kid in a single hotel room because you can't put more than three or two or four people in a hotel room. And, you know, what do you do when you've got four kids and two parents? You put them in two different hotel rooms with no sink or, you know, or no refrigerator. So it, it has to be renovated to specifically meet housing standards. And that takes dollars to do. And hope is one of those opportunities, but we no longer have that hope trust because 80% of it was swept. You got a call, Mary? I, I think I do. Yeah. So this, this call comes to us via anonymous and uh, we'll we'll take this call and and, Ooh, and ask anonymous. and ask anonymous anonymous. Are you there? And you're on the air. How you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Do you have a question or a comment? Hello. Thank you for this morning's program. It's I think you know something that um, all of Florida feels. But um, I, you know, been in um, this area about twenty years and um, originally from California, and the uh, the housing (laughs) has gone up for a long time over there, and, um, you know, people move to and from it, and, um, you know, it's on everyone's mind. I, um, my first thought on this was um, my friend, for my friend who was gonna, is going to be homeless um, tomorrow, and because you know, it, it, you know he was trying to be ahead of the ball and move and had things, you know he was going, working, reaching out to organizations for veterans and um, Jews and for churches and stuff. But because he wasn't homeless already, he you know they. He didn't receive anything. He couldn't be ahead of the ball, and, and uh, or you know, it was he would have to lie and say he was already there, you know, and that and that just seems um, <laughs> doesn't doesn't seem fair, does it? No, I, so, right. and it is it is an emotional issue too, and we hear it in your voice. Listen, we appreciate you calling in. Thank you so and, much. And thank you for sharing your story with us. We appreciate that. One of the things that. people don't realize is that you don't qualify for anything until you're completely homeless. Yeah, that's crazy. You know, that's crazy. So madness. if you're almost homeless and you recognize it, almost you have to be homeless, homeless. Yeah. to be able to get yeah. in line. And, that you is know, so bizarre. It is, it is very dysfunctional because that means you've lost everything and you've got to start all over again. And those, that's where the council's advocacy is going to be critically important to help understand the dysfunction of the policies that so are So repeat, place. Um, when your meeting is coming up, you said you had a, a big meeting coming up? And, right. And is it open to the public? It is open to those that are interested in actually working because this is a working team. That's a team. working, yeah, yep, there you go. They are, the Housing Council has established four programs related leadership teams. So if you're a leader in this industry or would like to be participating with leaders on addressing housing, whether it's a developer builder that's looking to understand Live Local Act or how they can get involved or how they make that happen, that there's one team for that. There's another team for those folks that provide housing counseling and financial literacy and actually assist uh, when you have a tenant that needs to understand the rules associated with tenant laws and how to address an impossible eviction. Then there's the group that are the funders, the bankers, the foundations, the, the philanthropists, and the employers that need workforce housing. And then the last is the advocacy group. So they will meet on October 23rd at the Children's Board from 9 until 4. And you have a website, I'm sure. Yes, that is hlctb.org H- housing oh. leadership council tampa bay.org so it's just the initials housing leadership council of tampa bay well, well, can, I, can i piggyback on something that, that you just said that i think is worthy of note you know we have so many folks you know we are a state right where almost 50 percent of our gdp is hospitality and agriculture these are not you know, sectors of the economy that traditionally provide people with a, a wonderful living, very middle class at best. That's 50% of the state. 
how are we going to be finding a way to house these people if we're continuing to budget you know, or to balance our budget off the, the Sadowski funds? You know, Part of the reason Commissioner Owen cited his uh, support for sweeping the money was because— oh, you because, say sweeping, you mean killing. Yeah, effectively, you're right. Thank you. More appropriately, killing. Okay. This year's allocation. Well, he said, oh, his justification was there will be more money coming in from affordable housing from the governor and the legislature and uh, uh, something, you know, I, I think the Sadowski fund won't be rated as much as, you know, as, as it has been previously. And it's just so frustrating to see that, like, we all recognize the reality, right, of like 50 percent of the state is employed by sectors of the economy that don't pay you very well. And yet we're not building housing to house those people. So as, as you said, if you are working at a restaurant, how are you supposed to afford rent in the city of Tampa? If you're Caller, a teacher. Caller, is that your question? Like, I mean, it's just, it's so infuriating. I like, I, so what is the, what is the plan both for your organization and sort of writ large, I guess, to try to find solutions to those kind of problems? Well, as I mentioned, the last leadership team is uh, advocacy and policy and capacity building. So clearly one of that team will be in charge of actually educating our county commissioners on how the Sadowski Trust works, because it's very clear they don't understand. Um, oh, I'd like to read an email. I just I just opened an email here. It says, um, "Hotel vouchers and a Bible is child abuse." I have said that to the the BOCC every meeting for six months. Create family shelters with links to faith faith based services. Nine billion, and they can't fund that. Lynn Hertak has spoken two times now on a city shelter <clears throat> at City Hall, and that's last week's HUD four million giveaway. It says. And that's from Dave in North Tampa. So yeah, the hope the hope community is a different, uh, serving a different population. You can only be a single adult to live at Hope, and it's not the Hope funding that the county does. It's a city mayor supported program to actually help people that are truly homeless and single. Uh, with a place to be, so and that that's they have to get a place them off the corner. To get that, them that's off the, the corner, ones right. I was talking about. Right, and they. they and I'm going to have... give a shout out to John Bennett, uh, chief of staff over at the city. Mm -hmm. John has cared very passionately about these issues, and and I think he really pushed hard to get that hope shelter Community, or facility yeah. going. Yeah, but it doesn't address the the need for children. No, man, it'd be cool if his boss cared about things. Oh, Jason. Oh, boy. <laughs> we are down and dirty today. That's what we morning. do. That's what we do. And sometimes the, the youngster, Kimberly, he just comes off his chain every once in a while. We get it, we get it. You know what I mean? He starts running buck wild. We get, we get accused of being a little Tampa and Hillsborough-centric. But you said your organization. But that's where we live. Well, you said your organization <laughs> like, oh, is Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. So you're addressing this uh, region region wide. Region so what's wide. going on uh, in Pinellas? What's going on uh, in the rest of the region? I'm sure they're Pasco, facing the Polk, same. They've got the same issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah actually, and that was part of the reason why it is Tampa Bay. Initially, we're going to actually focus on gather, gathering the organization and getting it up and standing it up in Hillsborough as a starting point because the greatest big need county. is a big, the greatest need and the highest increase in property value impact that we've seen in the last 10 and years rents. is here in Hillsborough. But the goal is to actually establish independent individual boards that are part of the council in each of our surrounding counties because every county has a different flavor, you know, it has a different unique. set of issues. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that the, the councils that represent, say, Pinellas or Pasco or, or Manatee, as, you know, the Sarasota area, even as far as Hernando, if we want to go that far. But that, again, will be as this organization is supported by its community and its stakeholders to grow and be able to actually represent what's the best way of yeah. addressing our housing crisis. And, you know, it's interesting, Jason, you mentioned farm workers, okay? Um, the first board I ever was appointed to serve on by Phyllis Bizanski, mm -hmm. um, or by anybody, but Phyllis appointed me back in 19, late 1990s, mm -hmm. um, was to address farm worker housing issues down in the Ruskin area, which uh, w was a big deal, and I'm sure still is a big deal. And but but you're absolutely right, Kimberly. Every community, every county. They've all got their own, you know, th things going on. Yeah, Count Hillsborough is so large, it has its own <laughs> diversity. If you really consider the average median income of, say, the Waimama area as compared to the Hillsborough County's average, hmm. it's 
by 39,000 as opposed to the average for Hillsborough County, which is up getting close to between 55 and 60. And that's why we need to cut funds for enterprising Latinas, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Don't, don't even get me started on that one. But but I had See, the pleasure. See, there's that young whippersnapper. I, oh, man, I, came, I, came, I came prepared today. Yeah. I had the pleasure of also being appointed by Phyllis Bozanski to the Housing Finance Authority about the same time. And I think that's actually where you and I met, John. Oh. I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely walk down memory lane we take today. Ten years that for sure. was like, like the corners of our minds. Oh my god, are we doing Barbara Strikes right now? Okay, I just want to make sure that that was happening. I was even sure. Babs makes an appearance here on Down and Dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. So what? Uh, tell us more. What's going on? Um, do you do you have staff yet? Or oh or? no, I am basically the most. Ex- all inexpensive of volunteer on the face of the earth right all now. All of it. Yeah, I, I who's do. Fun, who's funding, um, you know, you or, you know, what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, or right, you, you're right volunteering? Or? I'm volunteering for all practical purposes. <laughs> I do have a small grant from uh, Wells Fargo through the CDC of Tampa. I have been supported by the United Way uh, with, the, with the tools, what's called Resilia, the, to help with... A capacity building for a are new you five hundred one c three? And we you, are five hundred one c three. You can take donations. I certainly can, and if you go to the website, we will give you some callers. There's going to be a big button but there. But you know, I, I, let's be serious about that. And and uh, I know we're not supposed to pitch and plug other organizations, so I'll I'll go easy on it. But you know, at the end of the day, people are listening. They care about these issues, and you're out there doing something positive and trying to corral all these folks, uh, you know, from different perspectives and. And you need funding. I mean, uh, you, you got you to gotta eat, Kimberly. Uh, yeah, actually, my, my, uh, my bill collectors would appreciate any support at this point. <laughs> but I will say this. Uh, it's an it's a opportunity to really give back to a good cause. And the, the Housing Leadership Council's efforts and the work that I'm doing is a love. You know, I know that it's going to make a difference in our community, so I'm investing my time and resources to make that happen. Fewer, fewer things more important than helping people that don't have a place to call yeah. home. Truly. Exactly. So the website's a great place to go to if you want to learn more and, and want to help out. We're, we're, we're speaking to you, Commissioner Donna Cameron Cepeda. So, <laughs> so let me just go ahead and, and, and while we're throwing a little bit of dirt on... on uh, 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 um, what do I want to say? County Commissioner. You don't have to get her name yeah, right. It's okay. Cepeda? Is that what it was? It's okay. Cepeda. 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 No, we no, no. Have to help you with your Latin. How, uh, no, however, however, <laughs> however, um, you know, it just seems like she was thrust into this position uh, woefully unprepared. And, and it's not getting any better because, you know, all you have to do is watch. And when you watch, it's it's. Excruciating. She sat there silently. I mean, like for the record, for those who didn't watch the meeting, let, let's put this in perspective, okay? Every single other member of that county commission at least expressed some form of ideology or ethos or a reason for their vote, whether you agreed with them or you disagreed with them, at least they had the wherewithal to articulate their reasoning. She sat there. She's a better mime than she is a commissioner. She's like, I hope I'm trapped in a box and I can't get out. I mean, it's embarrassing. So, Every single person else, uh, else up there took the time to say what they're voting the way they're voting. Yeah, and in contrast... Can we get her to call in and defend herself? In contrast, uh, Tampa City Council, right around the same time period... Doubled... Doubled their money. Doubled their money for affordable housing and uh, from like 5 to $10 million. Yeah. And uh, kudos. And then the question was, well, where are you going to get that money from? And just like you mentioned, Kimberly, um, earlier on, they took it from the reserve fund, which was overfunded. Yeah. You know, it was like 23%. As we discussed on the show mm-hmm. with uh, Mr. Mantega. 23%. They took it down a little bit, took a little bit of that reserve money and put it toward somewhere. What what was that great quote that Guido had? He said, it's a, it's with the emergency is now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this today is the rainy day. That's I mean, it. like the, the, the rainy day has been going on for a long time. The unfortunate thing is we're dealing with the systemic issues. Yeah. And in this case, it, they're actually just reducing their contribution to the reserve funds for the county. I, the city actually, I know, has some challenges, and but they made a commitment. And I appreciate the fact that they actually actually delivered on those commitments. We, the county has three new commissioners that have never served, as far as I can tell. I mean, I'd love to have somebody do the research on it, but I couldn't find it. It never served on any citizens advisory boards, and that's a problem. So... If you come in inexperienced and you expect good results, 
it's hard for voters to actually trust the process. And that's why we need to know who we're voting for. Elect clowns get a circus. Former Listen. County Commissioner Kimberly Overman, we appreciate it. Gosh, all this has been such a, this has been a great Thank show. All you've done, all Thanks you do. Thanks for having me. And all you're going to do. And all you're going to continue to do. Absolutely. Big fans here down in Derby. Surely. Listen, we would like to thank all of our callers, emailers, texters today. Special thanks to Irene, our phone screener. On behalf of Jason Marlowe, John Dinkfelder, I'm Mario Nunez saying salute and happy days. And stay tuned now for the skinny. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you, guys, so much. Mario. Yeah, congratulations, Mario. Truly, well deserved, man. Okay, congratulations. Okay, I guess I'll have to. I'll yeah, you're gonna have to suck it up and I'll deal with the fact that we're gonna praise you for the last five seconds before we switch to. I don't a, mind. A I song, don't mind. Can I ring a bell for myself? I'll we ring love, it. We love you, man. A song truly dedicated to you. Everybody, take care.